What is up, guys, and welcome back to the Sweat It Out podcast. Today, we have a special guest, literally here in our home base, Miami. This is going to be an exciting one. Guys, get ready for a bunch of energy, a bunch of tear-up, a bunch of savagery. This person, she is a broker. She is a entrepreneur. She is the owner of the Calderon Estates. Help us welcome the one and only Zuli Calderon. How are you? Hey, guys. What's Whoa. going on? What's happening? What's up? Oh, what's up, man? Happy uh, Thursday. Thank I you know. for having me here. Thank you for being here. We made yeah. it happen. I know. Finally, right? That's it. We were way overdue. Way overdue. I know. And I'm so excited here. to be here. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Appreciate it. So overall, how you've been? How's the real estate going? How's business? How's life? Life is good, man. Life is always good. Uh, business is good. Um, just a lot of business as far as like uh, the team is growing more. Thanks to God. We're expanding in different markets. Uh, more offices coming soon in different states. Um, everything's going great, you know, just putting more systems in place and keep pushing forward. Just so just let, let's pushing. dive, let's dive into that. You, you team, different markets, you know, real estate, tell us a little bit of how you got into the real estate game and then how you've been able to start putting a team together and then not only station yourself here, but expand to these other areas. So I actually got into real estate six years ago. I come from a family who owns a lot of real estate. They've been in real estate for like 30 plus years, but um, that wasn't always my start. I was like, oh, let me do corporate America. I know the right way. So I did corporate America. I got my master's in international sales and business. I thought that was the right way to go. And um, I quickly realized that I was never happy. I capped out on what I could make. So six years ago, I got into the real estate game. Um, I purposely put myself through hell to like reach rock bottom in the game because, you know, I have really audacious goals, as you know. So I wanted to learn from the best. Um, I got involved very quickly around the best. I quickly also got into mentoring, coaching with some of the top sales coaches for prospecting, cold calling, et cetera. And um, I've just been on the climb ever since, you know, and uh, for the last three years, I was top producing agent. I've been selling 75 plus homes every single year since I first started real estate. Well, my first year, I, it didn't go so good. Obviously, I was it, I was just soaking up a lot of information and just learning and practicing and stuff like that. Um, and then it really took off for me the second year as I was applying the information that was being taught to me. And I've just, this is where I'm at. So then after I decided that I wanted to do a team so I can grow bigger in my numbers and scale up and now provide value to other people, that I saw needed it um, because not necessarily everyone that's been in real estate or starts real estate know exactly which direction to take. And something else that I saw missing in the sector is a lot of authentic um, coaches and mentors that are really going to guide you and give you a lot of value from the very beginning. So I wanted to fill that gap in and then I joined George Cancioelo with Lifestyle and I just started putting my information out there. The numbers talk for themselves and now I have a team of 12 women. We're going on to 16. And so here I am. Man, I love that story. Girl power all the yeah, way. all the way. So That's it. let me ask you this now. So you're recruiting, you're getting a lot of people. Right now, the market, we can turn on the TV. Everyone's talking about recession, depression. A lot of realtors that came in during 20, 21, they rode the hype of, you know, the COVID, everyone going crazy, the buying, low interest rates. Now the economy has changed completely. 100%. And now it's a different type of uh, purchasing, you sure. know, it kind of, we could say it's a buyer's mark, but not really. It's weird. Mm. So working with your girls and training them and teaching them, how are you pivoting in this new market so they can be the most, will be the, be the best version of themselves in this market right now? Sure. So there's definitely a lot of uncertainty and a lot of, there's a lot of fear, right? Um, one of the things that we mostly focus on every single day is our mindsets, Right. Understanding the shifts that are happening, understanding the economy of the markets, uh, not just in the U.S., but globally, understanding what's causing these changes. And and it's not just now. It's been happening always in history. So it's pretty much studying those markets and understanding what position we have to take to um, beat out the sector. Right. So number one is just keep doing the same thing that you've been doing. Put your head down, grind even harder. Right. 10x everything that you're doing. Number two is following a system. Right. Time management and and really learning how we can be better. So a lot of people tend to freak out and quit, 
that's what we're actually seeing already, like a 16% dip in real estate agents that are quitting the game because they're scared of the unknown. The truth is, I don't see a crash happening the way that it, the way that it was back in 2009, 2006. I, I lived through that moment as well with my family. I do see this market being, it's, it's heading more towards a cash market and a rental market, especially here in Florida, because we still have a lot of demand of people that want to come and live here. So as far as Florida or South Florida, Broward and Palm Beach, I really don't see it being so heavily impacted. Um, so I just constantly remind them of where we're at currently um, compared to other markets out in the US. Do I think there's inflation? Obviously, as we all know, of course there's inflation. Um, do our interest rates high? Of course, interest rates have to be high. The Federal Reserve had to do that in order to balance things out, quote unquote. But, you know, it's, it's, it's a monopoly. Okay, this is business. I mean, at the end of the day, the market has shifted. We even see it now. There's a 22% um, decrease in home prices right now, currently. Not decrease in sales, but in prices. So all that's telling me is there's still people looking to purchase in Miami, in Broward, in Palm Beach, all the way up to Tampa. You know, I'm going to cover Tampa as well. Um, we just have to be a little bit more diligent with the information that we're providing and the loans that we're speaking of and learning how to play with that interest rate. Um, a lot of people are buying who are not from Florida and listen, a lot of them are investors. And they're like, how does it make sense for me to buy in, in South Florida when the prices are so crazy? But also the rentals are going up. They're actually up a 25%. And they're going to continue to be up for the next four or five years, okay? And a lot of them are going to buy and they're going to refinance. And then once you refinance, you have like a, you know, a normal mortgage, which is already going to be paid off by, uh, being paid, I'm sorry, by the tenant. So it's just understanding the investment side and what's currently happening. And we talk about this every single day. 100%. And I think actually this is good for the market because there's a stat that 90% of agents that go into the market the first year fail or drop out of real estate. 100%. And it's great because the mar it, this is weeding out those who really want to do real estate and those who are just there trying to ride this wave and now the party's over. That easy money, that free money is gone. Now you really got to door knock, cold call, follow up, wake up. Get dirty, baby. Get dirty. Get, get down get the floor dirty. and yeah. roll around. So it's great that this is happening. It's a wake up call for businesses who are not pivoting and who are not making the transition that they need to do. The good thing is that you're making a pivot with your girls and showing them what they need to do. Now, I do see that the biggest issue going on with Miami is that even if you're an investor, the cap rate here sucks because mm -hmm. if you're buying, you're speculating. And I do right. agree with you too. You know, if the interest rates do go up, people are sitting on so much equity. Now, those that bought in 2021, 2022, and even now, it's going to be rough. If the market does reset, because now you're going to be sitting on, you probably might be underwater. Right. So, what would be the best, I guess, for any realtors are watching is what's the best prospecting uh, formula that's worked for you that you've seen the most success? Cold calling. For me, it's always picking up the phone and making that call, even if it's through Internet sales, right, through social media. I mean, what good is it if you get leads or, you know, Realtor.com, Zillow, you know, all these other third party vendors that you pay for every single month, but yet, you know, you can't even transition one lead. At the end of the day, you have to pick up the phone and dial. I think a lot of real estate agents get into this game with the mindset that this is going to be easier. They compare themselves to your life currently where you're at because they didn't understand your beginning or they didn't see your struggle or it really goes behind closed doors. But I'm here to say today, and I always say the same shit, which is, man, get your story straight. Like this is, we're here to plant some seeds, build a massive business. And this is not for the weak hearted or the faint hearted. You know, you have to have balls on the table and you have to work really hard and you have to touch a lot of doors, as you know. Yeah. And you have to make a lot of calls, possibly 100, 200 calls a day now with the market how it is to get that one person that's going to give you a shot, you know, and then go back to basics, be humble, put your head down, practice on your skills and go right back at it the next day. 100 you know? percent. And how do you how do you, um, you know, when it goes around coaching your girls, specifically, you see it happen a lot with the youth um, where, you know, they're so used to the social media, the instant leads when it comes through ads and all this other stuff and instant gratification. And, you know, it's just, it's landing here or they expect it to land on here. How do you have that conversation with them where the shit, the shit's not like this when it comes to real estate? You have to go fight for it. You have to go cold call. You have to go knock at certain moments on, on the door. You have to go out there and make it happen, extend your hand in order to get that lead. How do you engrave that into them? Because I feel like and not just real estate, but I feel like in in business all around it today, you're dealing with a lot of youth issue where it's like, hey, 
here on the table where in reality we know that's not how business works. So how do you how do you work with your girls, especially the young ones that, you know, really need to understand that? That's a good question. Um, we actually talk about that every single day because it's a challenge. Um, it's a constant um, emotional and mental battle um, because they want instant gratification. So I go, I always say the same thing, okay, which is anything that comes fast leaves fast. I share a lot of my story consistently. I connect them with some of my coaches, some of my greatest friends. I've been in the game for a very long time, so they can hear their stories where it comes out of a place of, you know, humbleness and realness, like live and center, not through social media, because a lot of times we see people through social media and we think it's that easy with their with the things that they're saying and that they're preaching. And I also let them know, like, hey, listen, at the end of the day, these people are saying these kind of things because they've been through hell and back. You know, so it's not about instant gratification. Like, I don't even, as a matter of fact, I interview people, right, that, that belong as part of my culture because I don't just get anybody. It has to be a specific type of person with a specific type of mindset because I don't want no bitch shit, like I'm always saying. Like, you got to play the game very smart and you got to understand shit takes time. Like, businesses take time, you know. So if you're in the game of instant gratification, then this shit's not for you. Like, I'm definitely not for you. So for any broker out there and, and any or any agent wants to become a broker and start their own team, what's your vetting process in, in when it comes to hiring? What do you what do you walk people through? What are the questions you ask when you're vetting out to see who fits into your culture? I always try to I always try to get to their needy greedy as far as their why. Like why do you want to be a real estate agent? Why do you want to join the team? Like what drove you to get your license? Are you looking to just get pie? Are you married? Do you have kids? Like what's your five year plan? You know, um, do you do well under stress? Um, can you handle accountability? Because that's another thing. People don't want to be held accountable for shit. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I just say like the needy gritty, the tough questions from the very beginning. You know, I really start peeling out the banana, like I like to say, and uh, like get to like what really drives them every single day. If I just feel like it's a bunch of bullshit and there's no emotion to it, there's not a story, there's not a hardship. I mean, I personally don't want you. I want people that are movers that are going to make money. You know what I mean? Um, and I really just think it all starts with your type of experiences. Um, I've been pretty lucky so far, so, but um, it's not too easy to get into the Calderina States. Damn. Yeah. All right. I like it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Put heard it. You guys heard any agent there, out there, you heard it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, listen, it all comes with a lot of love, right? A lot of respect, a lot of love for everybody. Um, at the end of the day, I think we're all so different and so beautiful in our own, in our own ways. And we all seek for our own self-interest. Um, but you're just not, I'm not for everybody and people are not always for me. And I've come to learn that very early on in my career and in my life, been, been through a lot of experiences and that's okay too. Like you have to know exactly who you are and where you stand and you have to portray that message to the kind of people that you want around you. Cause that's what you're going to draw to yourself. So. Wow. And what's your, what's your story that got you here? Cause it sounds like there's like a big, like an obstacle or something that you went through that got you to where you're at today. Yeah. So what's driving you? Um, you know, it's multiple things for me. It started really early on when I lost uh, my father to cancer. I pretty much had to grow up really quickly when I was 14 years old, going on 15. And then by the time I was 18, 19, I lost all my grandparents from both my mom and my dad's side. And then my mother got remarried and she moved to Colombia. So then I had to kind of figure all that out on my own because um, I was just going to school. You know, I thought that was like the way to go 100 percent. And I was really like a baboon in my house. So I had to grow up really easily and understood really early on that nothing lasts forever. Like it's my duty to make the best out of what I got with the time that I have. Because my parents came from Cuba with nothing to give me freedom and to give me this life, then now it's up to me to make the best out of it. So that really got to me, that really affected me. Um, after I was done with school and I pretty much lost everybody, I moved out on my own, which was another hard experience for me. I had no idea what I was doing. I was actually working in a CrossFit gym for like four or five years um, while I was still going to school. And then I was working a medical job in the morning. So I've pretty much been doing, you know, I've always been busy uh, up until maybe I was 28. Um, and I went through a lot of hardship. You know, I, I was, it was driving me crazy. Also, like my mom moving, I couldn't help her financially. Now I see myself with, you know, less family, less people. How do I figure things out? I didn't want to be in a financial burden all the time. Um, so I think, you know, that just really got to me. And then I got married to an amazing human being. I got married and then we ended up getting divorced. And that was an experience itself because I moved to Cali and I pretty much left everything that I knew here. Um, 
And then that's when I really started all over. So what I did was I lied to my family, which is my brothers and my mom. I put all my things in a Greyhound. I left it. I, I brought it over here to uh, a warehouse in Doral, and I slept in an inflatable bed for a year in one of my mom's best friend's house on purpose because I didn't want to say the truth to my family. And during that year was when I got my real estate license. I got into Grant Cardone coaching, Mike Ferry coaching. Jalal helped me tremendously my first year. A big shout out because he knows fully my story. He was there. Um, and then just, you know, that just really got to me. The fact that I purposely put myself through this and never seeked my family for what they have or don't have and just start fucking shit up, you know. And then I think when you lose so much so early on, it puts you in a position of power. So you no longer fear anything because you know you could do it over and over and over again. So, um, and here I am today. I have my mom retired. I own some real estate investments. I have some Amazon stores. I mean, I have several businesses. I'm a broker. I'm a mortgage broker. I have my team. And I just, I'm, I, it's, it's just the beginning for me. So what's next now? Is it, is it continue? We're continuing building this team. And then you said we're going into their markets, right? Yeah. So um, we're going to open up in Tampa in the next uh, two, three months. Okay. I'm going to expand my Calderina States team there. And I'm partnering up with, uh, with my partners up in Tampa. And then after Tampa, we're going to go to Austin, Texas. And then we are going to go to Georgia. So Expanding. Yeah. That's within the next year. So how's, how's that going to differentiate and as far as like the way you built your team here? Are you going to copy and paste that model? Is there different things that you're going to do over there in these markets? Uh, can, what, what, what does that look like for you? Maybe you can walk us through that operation. Uh, I'm going to do the same thing that I'm doing here. Definitely more systems in place, more organization, um, the right people to hire, right, to manage certain roles for the team, you know, new hires, recruits, uh, systems, uh, prospecting, all that good stuff. I'm going to pretty much do what I'm doing here and just mimic it in each and every market. Um, it's working. You know, I think once you find like your systems and your people and the right, mm -hmm. the right movement, you know, you just you take it from there. You just keep growing. How big? Well, you kind of said a little bit that coaching has impacted your life tremendously. Yeah. But what was Big that? Time. What was that? Oh shit! Moment like, hey, I don't know what I need what to know it? more. You know, <laughs> what was it? What was a that aha moment? Um, <clears throat> I had two aha moments, but the biggest one for me was when I I saw myself at twenty eight, I think, years old, uh, and I was in the I was sleeping in an inflatable bed, and I questioned what I wanted for the rest of my life. I just looked around one day and I'm like, what the fuck am I doing? Like, who gives a fuck am I, if I'm a woman? Who cares if I'm starting all over? Like, who cares about any of this? Like, what do I need to do now to get better? Like, who do I need to go knock on whose door? Who do I need to present myself to? Where do I need to be at? Like, who do I need to speak to? Like, whatever it took. Um, and then I always, I, it was always like, okay, a dream is just a dream if you don't put it down in paper and you don't execute with, a, with an end date. And that was, that's what was missing. What is Zuli going to do to take point A to point Z? Um, and that was one of my aha moments when I just like dead broke, no direction, no idea what I was going to do. Um, and that's it. That was my, well, that was one of my aha moments. And then obviously when I lost a large portion of my family, I realized that that's it. It's, it's just all me. So, so what were some of the things you had to do? You know, you went through mentorships, you went through coaching, but what were some of the day-to-day -day applications you had to take and implement into your life to basically take that aha moment and turn it into this is going to be the dream I'm living now. This is what I'm creating for myself in the future. Yeah. So I had to start living as the person that I wanted to be in the future. So I realized if I wake up a little bit earlier than my competition, I was already going to start beating my competition. Um, looking at it as far as like a year out, I was going to have more hours and more time in my day to dominate the fucking sector, mm -hmm. right? So I had to start paying attention and studying millionaires and billionaires and my coaches and what they were doing and why they were doing it. Why? Why is it important to wake up at fucking four in the morning? You know, why is it important to work out for one hour a day? Because that's super important to me, as you know. Um, why is it important to write your goals to journal, to have like your set schedule in the morning so then you can execute the rest of the day, right? So I started implementing that. Um, I started waking up at 4 a.m. on the dot every single day. I started, as, upon waking up, I was meditating, which, you know, I still do that now, writing my goals out, right? My affirmations, my goals, my journal, um, reading a book, you know, a chapter every night. Um, those are the things that I started implementing, right? Like not just listening to what my coaches were saying, but actually putting it into practice. Um, and man, that's changed my whole life. Ooh, 
you gave me some chills right there. Yeah, it really <laughs> has, man. Because I think it's like really it's true, easy. It's powerful. It yeah, I, I mean, I just think it's really easy. Like when you say you want to do something, but then you don't really execute on it and you don't really follow through. Because it's kind of like, right, when people are like, oh, I want to lose weight, the, uh, the, the new year, the new year, January 1st, I'm going to go to the gym. And then you like 30 days, 20, uh, 40 days later, they're like fucking out. They give yeah. up, right? Because they don't want to do the shit that's fucking hard. Yeah. Yeah. To it's get a, you to a better position. I forgot what that thing that I think they saw it the other day or a few times that Elon Musk put something in, uh, you know, that there's a person that it can take them 30 days to clean their house. Yeah. And then it could take them the other one three hours. Totally. Right. It's just how you approach it. It's, it's really true. how you approach it. So if you approach it with a mentality, I'm going to get this done in X amount of time, you will get it done. But if you, well, I'll do a little bit here and then, eh, and then you drag it on. And then next, you know, you're like, oh shit, it's taken me three weeks to get this one thing yeah. done that I could have done literally in, in a few hours. Yeah. You know, and you see that as a big problem across the board, not just, you know, in, 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 in certain people, but you're seeing it on a lot of people nowadays yeah. where they're just extending everything and just more laid back. Yeah. And what, what do you think the reason for that is? I think it's self-interest and what you really give a fuck about. I think things that you really give a fuck about is what you're really going to put the most importance to and get that shit done. And then I think you're going to keep telling yourself bullshit lies and excuses not to do the other stuff, which is as equally important to your life and for your growth. Um, so I just think they kind of put it like in the back burner, right? I mean, I've done that several times and then like you got to check yourself like, oh shit, I'm doing that again. Like, no, no, no. Okay. Like this is as equally important. Um, so I just think it's the bullshit excuses that you tell yourself for like the fear of the unknown, Right. Um, and just like really time management as well is like a huge thing. Um, I don't think you people know, don't know how to manage their time correctly all the fucking time, only for the one thing that they know. But then there's other things that you have to like implement within your time as well to be able to expand and to grow. Right. So, so what would you I say? Think. What's a tool right now that you can give to people for prioritizing time management that you can give to the audience right now? Well, for me, for instance, I use two calendars and I have my I have my Google calendar on my laptop, on my computers. I have my cell phone calendar and then I have my hard copy calendar. And then now finally I have my assistant. So she's helping me with that as well, just to keep everything like locked and loaded. So I would just say to really follow your calendar, something that you've always talked about, Anthony. And I respect you so much for that because you are a fucking champion when it comes to that shit. Um, so I would definitely say to follow your calendar 100%. Whatever goes on there, just stick it through, man, no matter what. Let me ask you this. So you're already dominating. You're, clear, you're, you're killing it. Thank you. You brought up Amazon store. What is that about? Is, is this something legit or what, what, are, what is this? Of course, Brian, what do you mean? <laughs> Brian. I don't know, Love man. Brian, man. I, I need to know what these Amazon stores are. <laughs> hey. So the way that the route that I chose, right? It's, uh, to, so two of my friends, I'm actually going to do a podcast with them next week, uh, Elton and, and Pedro, they own um, an Amazon business, an automation Amazon and Walmart business, as well as a trucking business. Um, they pretty much do everything for me. They manage the whole entire store for me, right? You go in with a certain amount of money, and the, depending on the amount of money that you go in with, that's what you're going to receive back every single month, depending on the type of credit and money flow that you have to purchase um, And this items. is not for everybody. This is a select few people, right, that they pick? No, this is for everybody. Okay. Yeah. Because I've heard you have to qualify or select a few people. No, 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 it's okay. for everybody. If Well, I mean, if you have good credit and you have some money in the bank, I mean, of course, like, you yeah. know, or like a good credit card or whatever that you can throw on there to purchase like your items. I love my Amazon stores. I'm a lucky girl with it. You know, it's passive income. I don't do shit. I just pay attention to the numbers in the back end. Um, I talk to my accountant once a month for the states that we have to pay taxes on every single month. Um, it's I think it's a great business. It's a no brainer. It gives you back over a 20 percent. Oh, that's, that's, that's great. That's amazing. And what products are you like pushing or selling or? So right now we have a dog store, like a dog, like a pet store. And then we have a baby store as well. So, oh, but so products that hit. yeah. So are you selling baby formula or? Well, there's a wish, shortage man, right I now. wish, <laughs> shit, you know, I'm your girl, man. If I, if I come up with that, I'll Yo. let you know. <laughs> um, the no, cauldron but formula. can you imagine? Don't even give me ideas, man. I'll just, uh, yeah. no, but so I don't really, like I said, I don't have control of my store because they manage it for me. Um, so it's kind of like a win-win. They take a percentage. I take the larger percentage and um, it's amazing. It's great. It moves. Amazon moves. Everything e-commerce moves. What else so, are you looking to now besides the Amazon store? Are you looking for other digital products, any other digital investments that you're, you're uh, looking to do? Or is this the only thing that you're focused on right now? As far as selling? Uh, yes, yeah, online. 
So this is it as far as like Amazon and Walmart. And then I'm coming out with my course, right? For everyone who's been in the real estate game and in sales that, you know, I've gotten a lot of inquiries about, you know, how do I properly prospect? How do I form my business? What do I do after I get a deal? What do I do when I get the listing? How do I negotiate? How do I object, et cetera? So I'm putting all that together and I'm about to um, finish that very soon for everybody that's interested. So that's going to be the next thing. Um, and then after that, I mean, it's going to be some coaching involved as well. I know we talked about it and, um, and that's it. And then I'm going to be focused really heavy on the expansion of the business for the offices and buying more real estate. Love it. Take, take us to the course for a second. What are the pillars um, of the course? Give us a little bit insight of exactly what you're going to be touching upon. What are some of the things people can expect from it? And uh, maybe there's one thing you can share with right now. They can start applying right away and they can uh, definitely jump into that course. So for sure. So some of the pillars that we're going to be talking about is how to handle objections. Okay. How to handle objections, how to handle rejection. What's from the beginning to the end of the phone call, right? From like leaving a voicemail, if they don't answer you from your pitch, your tonality, the first five seconds to capture someone's attention. Those are the most important five, ten, five, 10 seconds. If you even get that with a potential seller, a potential client on the phone, as you know, Brian. Um, so I get really into detail with that um, in my in my courses. I'm also talking about learning how to handle the psychology behind all the rejection and the objection. Because I know a lot of agents, a lot of people in sales, they give up the first time around that they get hung up on or they get told no. But the truth is every time you you get a no, it's actually closer to a yes. So I'm actually teaching people um, how to overcome that and see why you're closer to a yes. So we're really digging in, in deep into asking more why questions and how and for what to the seller or your potential clients in whatever realm you, you, know, you practice sales in. Um, so we're gonna get really into that as, as well as my coaching. I know a lot of people are like, oh, I wanna train with you, I wanna talk with you, but you know, so I'm gonna get really, really, you know, into that as far as like accountability and what are the right um what are the right steps to take every single day to get you to those five to ten listings every single month so basically what i'm going to be teaching is um teaching people how to make a hundred calls a day to be able to transition anywhere from two to six uh, listings per month in a nutshell wow yeah i i, <laughs> I love that so it's just straight cold calling then I mean, yes, because I feel like that's, for me, that's what's worked in my business. And time over and over and over, I see like at the end of the day, man, for those of you that don't think you're in sales, you're in fucking sales every single day. Every day that you wake up, you're selling yourself, no matter what type of sales you're in, right? So you have to learn the game of sales. It's a, psycho it's a psychological game. So I'm going to go really deep into that because I think people get scared. Um, you know, I think people really stop filling up their, their fullest potential because of fear, because of the unknown, um, because they think a no is a no. So I really want to dig more deeper into that with people. Yeah. A hundred percent. What's the name? What's the name real quick of the course? Well, I don't know yet. I'm still debating the name. I'm stuck between yeah? three names. What are the yeah. three? Well, one of them was make real estate great again, which I absolutely love. Um, I did have a name for my PDF that I know we've talked about, mm -hmm. but I don't want to share that one because I'm not too sure if it's if it's going to be that or I have another one that's called uh, Zuli's Masterclass, uh, Sales Masterclass. So I really don't know yet 100% the name. Uh, I, that's what kind of has me stopped a little bit until I figure that out, that it really has to, um, it has to be very significant for me and it has to pop out for me, so... Well, the good thing here is that it, everything that your your own team learns, other teams are going to be able to learn this. 100%. So, you yeah. know, I, I always say it's they're going to get what's working for you already with your own team. It's sure. proven. It works. You've done it for yourself. You're doing it for your team. You're going to go ahead and do that in, in the other markets that you're going into. So you're teaching something you're really good at and you know a lot about, which I think it's one of the most important things that coaches out there need to focus on is when you get into coaching, you have to first go into your first course, whatever you're teaching with something you know a lot about. Don't try to get caught up into like, oh, I kind of know this and it sounds sexy, it's trendy. No, teach what you know a lot about because there's an audience for that and um, you're exactly doing that. Look, bro, Thank it you. comes down to knowing your numbers. At the end of the day, it comes down to knowing your numbers. Yep. If you don't know your numbers, you don't know shit because if your conversion rate's down, you're putting content, you're putting all that foo-foo material out there and no one's foo -foo. buying it. <laughs> it's true because there's a, the internet is full of a It was a foo-foo example. I know, right? I was just going to ask him that. There's a bunch, bro. Go on YouTube and, and just click on somebody. And they're teaching you very watered down things. It's true. They're not teaching you principles. It's fine. It's good. You know, there's courses out there and I've bought courses. I'm not going to even say the names of the people, but you bought it and you're like, what is this shit? You know, what am I looking yeah. at? So 
you know, coming back to what you were saying, it's, it's about knowing the numbers. That's how you build your confidence within this business because sales is predictable if you understand what are the metrics that are driving your business That's at it. the end of the day. And if you don't know your numbers, you don't know anything. Yeah. And the majority of people think that, yeah, you know, you're in real estate. It's, a, it's an easy business. Your grandma, abuela, whoever it is, is going to give you the deal. But to make real money here where you're making 200 grand, 300 grand, where it's possible to do that in this business, 100%, yeah. very few you can do that and be your own boss. The best of the best know their numbers. To be a top producer, the 10% of the 90 that are failing, you have to know your numbers, you have to know your ratios, and you have to know your metrics. And that goes to social media, that goes to what you're selling. And, that, and the numbers never lie. Because at the end of the day, if your product is good, it's going to show. Absolutely. I mean, listen, I'm a numbers girl. And I always tell the team every day, I'm like, I, I exhaust myself from repeating the same thing. At the end of the day, we are in a numbers game, right? So you have to understand your numbers, which is actually one of the first things I talk about after our affirmations and stuff, like breaking down the numbers again in our goals, right? Because it's a lot of coaches or people out there say, yeah, I want 50 listings by the end of the year. But then now how do you break that down? What is it going to take? For you to get to that right and it's not only like the mindset right it's also the metrics like how many calls are you making how much talk time are you having like there's a reason for that you know you do your 100 calls a day which should equal about two and a half hours of talk time every single day which will give you two appointments per week minimal if you're if if you're like not that skilled in the beginning all right if you're very skilled you should have an appointment every single day right you go after that fucking bull and then after you get those two to, two to four appointments every single week should give you about four to six listings per month. That's just the way it fucking is, right? Because the more you go out there and you set appointments and you go present it, the higher the chances are of you getting the listings. And what's, so. an, and what's an average, let's say, you know, one of these girls, what's an average? They're doing that consistently, getting that many listings. About average, how much can they be making? Monthly or yeah. yearly? Or year, monthly, yearly. To start? Like a first? Yeah, uh, like, a first, like a, for anybody out there who's new. Well, my girls, they're going to be anywhere, I would say, uh, 50 to 70K their first year. Okay. Yeah, potentially. Yeah, So absolutely. coming into it, new realtor, 50 to 70K, but you have direction, you're on the way to then double, oh, the double that, triple that in the next year. Oh, absolutely. So within the next year, I would say easily by next year, they should be at 150. Because most real estate agents, what are they making when they first come in? To be very honest yeah. with you, there's a lot of real Not estate bro. agents, their first year or two years, they're probably like at 15,000. Yeah, Look, bro. The, because they also treat it part time. Uh, they, they treat it part time, and part time it could be an issue, but it, it goes falls back into the brokers. It falls back into the brokers because there's a lot of them that are half assing and doing a disservice to their people. Because remember, when you're training these these realtors, you're also breeding your competition. Mm -hmm. So it goes back for other uh, brokers out there. They need to start creating retention plans. They need to start creating better better ways of viewing their their person because a lot of them just see it as a corral. I'm going to bring you in, volume, you're in, and then you leave. The churn rate's disgusting. What's the average cost per client that you're bringing in? <clears throat> That's something that, that people need to know. When you're closing business and you get to that level, you're making 120 grand, maybe a 200K property is not worth your time to talk to that person. And it's not being a jerk about it. It's just saying, hey, my business costs are too much to even do that. So yeah, you were going to say something. So I'm going to... Yeah. So not all money is good money, right? So you have to know when to turn down stuff, exactly what you're saying. And that's one of the things too, that went before I started the Calderina States, States, I really sat down with myself and my, and my partner. And I was just like, the retention rate is everything for me. Cause that's what happens. People, a lot of these brokerages, they see you just like a number. And then all these agents are lost in the freaking world. And they give you like a little pamphlet and they're like, Oh yeah, read the pamphlet, go, go on YouTube. But that's not what you should do. At least that's not in the business that I feel like we're in. We're here to provide value to people and really guide them and show them. And of course, like, you know, you're breeding like future. Listen, a lot of these people might even leave you, but at least you know that you planted a positive seed. And because of what you taught them, they can continue, you know, passing that on as generations come and go. Right. Um, but I agree with you. One of the first things that I looked at was how do I retain my girls? Like, how do I retain the Calderina states? How do I not lose people? Um, granted, some maybe... One or two percent of the girls eventually might leave, might not. It all depends, right? Um, but how do I retain the majority of the girls to stay with me? So I have to be uh, an, an excellent example to that, right? I always have to be a step ahead of the game. I have to provide value, and I have to just give them the best of me. At a, I think a true coach is someone that really follows through with what they're saying. Like, do what you're preaching. Don't just preach and not do the shit that you're fucking yeah. saying, which pisses me off, you know? Like, if your team is out there grinding, you should be out there grinding. Like, go pound the phones. Go, go like, fix their, like, go listen to their calls. Like, go perfect their pitch. Go perfect what you need to go perfect, you know? Because you are a, a direct example of your team, and they are of you, too, so. Where do, when do you start seeing that, that switch in, in, in your team's uh, mentality and production? About how often within working with you is it, 
you know, within two, three months? Like, when do you see a switch of like, they're getting it? They're like they getting got it. it. Yeah. So, so far, I would say 85% of the girls right now, it took them two months, two and a half months. I mean, I'm running like a boot camp, you know? Um, I, I love them so dearly. They, they teach me so much every single day because we're all so different. We all come from uh, different backgrounds, right? Different cultures, different backgrounds. And I learned so much from them. Um, but, you know, I definitely hold them really accountable because I, I'm like, listen, if you survive this shit, like you're mm -hmm. ready to go. Mm -hmm. Like no market, no person, no, nobody can scare you. Like this is your business. This is your brand. This is your identity. Like go out there and fucking crush the sector, you know? So, so far what I've been seeing, two months. So what, you, so what do you say within for anybody who wants to take your course it's going to take around 90 days i would say 90 days 90 days yeah okay for sure if you're not getting coaching mentorship with me every single week i would say like maybe 90 to 180 days you need somebody to hold you accountable if you realistically are not accountable yourself right um, i don't think people value coaches enough as they should um and i think that's what's we need better coaches out there to elevate people's game so Zuli, what are you going to do when it comes to because you're you're very hands-on with your team yeah. You're very on there. You're very yeah. on top. You're very watching, listening. So when you go into these other markets now, how are you going to duplicate yourself? How are you going to be able to go out there and give that same level of energy into the Tampa office, into the Austin office? How are you going to do that? So I'm creating leaders within my teams, right? I'm creating leaders and I'm also paying attention to people that want to join the team that come from uh, different backgrounds and skills, administratively, uh, sales, corporate, et cetera, um, just to kind of start filling in those gaps for me for when I'm not there present. For instance, Tampa, I'm going to be there uh, at the beginning, right? Like I would say the first three months I would be there coming back and forth. But um, ultimately, we are going to have a business development manager that's going to take that role to kind of, you know, pay attention to what everybody's doing and also i have everybody connected through a google meet every single day a zoom meet midday and then um, and that's every single day aside from me physically being at the office mondays and fridays um, so i'm always going to be connected no matter how big the team gets it's very doable thanks to technology so there's a those are great points great things yeah. you just said and there's a piece of legislation that i want to talk about that's that's coming on i don't know if you're aware of it or if you guys have, have seen it but this, the threat of the 6% commission looks like it's coming. You know, it looks like right now there's a big lawsuit going on. It's going to go to Supreme Court where basically 6% commission might not be the standard anymore. And sellers might not be obligated to pay that commission anymore. So it might look like the buyer has to flip in and, and pay. the. I realtor. love that. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? Do you think, and, and, I, and I have my opinions on it. I want to hear yours first, but what's your thoughts on that? You think that's good for the market? You think that's going to create some rift? Sure. Absolutely. I mean, I'm going to be very honest with you, right? Uh, you know, even now, there's always challenges in the market, right? And sellers, would you agree that they never want to pay commission? Never do. I love all my sellers, but they never want to pay commission, right? That's yeah. always like the rebuttal. I don't want to pay commission. I think I could do this on my own, yada, yada. Well, in this truth. market, they think they, they could do it, but it right? changed They think now. they could do it, absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, Everybody um, thinks it. Everybody thinks they could do everything by themselves, right, until they can't. But um, so, yeah, I mean, like, listen, to be honest with you, I've been running my business uh, pretty much putting it on top of the buyer for a long time, to be honest. I negotiate. Everything's negotiable in real estate, right? It's numbers in any type of business. Um, do I think it might cause a little bit of disruption? Sure, because now what you're saying is that the buyer, not only do they have to come up with money for the closing costs and the down payment, now they have to have that little extra money in the bank to cover also your commission cost. So, well, I mean, yeah, it's going to shift a little bit. Not every buyer is going to have the money to pay for your commissions. But, I mean, listen, I've been doing that for a very long time. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. It's it's it's. I think what's going to happen is uh, I think this law that's being passed is is a is going to be a huge threat to the market. Sure, it's absolutely. Gonna, it's going to change it. Um, I think what they're trying to do is consolidate the real estate market because everything is so um, so kind of it's decentralized in a way because sure. each market, even within Miami, you can go to Kendall, South Beach. They're all different markets. They all sure. had different legislation, municipalities, federal, state sure. laws, and I think the the big problem that tech has and Zillow was trying to do it was mm -hmm. they were trying to consolidate and they couldn't because it's so layered and so intricate everything that's going on I think that the issue with this a lot of realtors are going to have to learn how to become listing agents instead of buyer agents sure I it, love that it, and what Zillow is going to do is Zillow is going to wipe out the buyer the buyers completely like the buyer agents are going to be gone you're gonna have the listing agent that's going to represent and actually handle that transaction 
and then they're going to get their 3% commission. <clears throat> and then the buyer's agent will at some point become irrelevant. I mean, listen, uh, so I'm not too aware of the whole Zillow situation. I just know very basic information. At the end of the day, they are the largest uh, third party uh, vendor, right, to pull information from our MLS, right, to then share it pretty much with the world or with the US. But um, at the end of the day, you have to remember, like, Zillow's still pulling out information from our system that we're paying for every single month, uh, every single year. I'm no, they're, sorry. they're pimping everybody out. They're pimping everybody fucking out. Um, listen, you just got to be more aggressive. You got to be more aggressive. And at the end of the day, I mean, do you really want to be talking to a person that sounds like a telemarketer on the phone? I mean, because that's really what they sound like, right? Listen, when I joined real estate, I, I was with uh, Keller Williams my first two years, uh, Keller Williams, Miami Beach. And I remember when I first joined, Gary Keller was in a massive lawsuit, which I think he's still in a, in a lawsuit with Zillow because it's like almost like we like to say, right, selfishly, it's almost like stealing our, our hard work to put it into, slap it onto their, slap it onto their website, into their database, and then sell it to other people, whoever, it's like the highest bidder, right, Who, whoever has more money to get the zip code, lock it in, I'll send you leads, whatever, um, and that was like a big thing, like I know he won part of it, but I don't know what's going on with that too much, to be very honest with you, but um I'm not really worried about Zillow. I don't give a fuck about Zillow, to be honest with you. At the end of the day, I know what I do. And if when you build your business correctly and you plant those seeds and you got skills and you know sales, no Zillow, no nothing is going to beat you out. What you got to do is make enough money, get enough skills, stack and rack, so then you could invest into systems that are going to put you out there as well, which is like your social platforms and your branding, That's which is everything. Say, build your fucking brand. Become a listing That's agent. It. That's Period. fucking it. The Calderina states, we only want, li we, we are a listing team. I don't want, you know, and it's all much love, of course, because I have a lot of investors and a lot of referral partners, um, a lot of love, of course, but um, we focus very heavy on listings now, which is why I take my team through the storm right now. Because once we're passing this storm and, and life keeps getting more complicated, right, um, they're going to be prepared for war, whatever that might look like. And then, of course, as you start making more money, you start investing more into your brand and stuff, which is kind of like your... Like your resume. Like at the end of the day, life is always fucking complicated. Fucking shit. It's I know. It's complicated man. all the time. There's always a this. There's always a that. It's a, a blessing. That. It is a blessing. It's a complicated blessing. It's a very complicated blessing. 100%. But um, but you know, it's it's a beautiful thing, man. I, I I don't think that we understand how how um, how lucky we really are to even be here in the U.S. and and to be you know just fucking lucky to yeah. have freedom. I agree. You know, and do what we need to do. So it's life is beautiful, man. So life where where amazing. where do you want to see? the real estate industry headed to in the next few years like what's your what's your in your your intake on that you know where would you like to see it go what would you like to see more out of and also as well from other brokerages what would you like to see other brokerages doing that's a good question i would definitely love to see more accountability and more transparency um definitely a lot more hands-on coaching with their agents especially brand new agents that are scared that have no direction they're really freaking out uh they need a sense of direction, right? A sense of protection of direction. I definitely want to see more mentorship, more leadership. I think we're lacking so much leadership in the real estate business. Um, I would love to see that, of course. And um, I would just love to see a lot more agents stay within real estate and be very successful, uh, learning the ropes the right way, but taking it very smooth and easy, you know, and not only staying, uh, not only staying as sales uh, professionals, but also converting themselves into investors as well. Like, you know, learn about the investment game, you know, learn that there's growth, there's always room for, for growth, for leadership. Um, you know, there's enough abundance and money out there for everybody to become mm -hmm. great and to take a piece of the pie. Is that something you're teaching your girls too? A hundred percent. Besides, you know, them doing the real estate biz, but actually investing into their own real estate? Oh, a hundred percent. My whole, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, you know, I want several doors. That's the, that's the only thing that makes sense, right? So I always teach them and I share with them, again, a lot of my story and my family and stuff like that. And I tell them, we have this amount of time. Within this time, like your credit has to be on point. You have to stack and rack. We have to list this amount of, of, of listings um, for in the next uh, year and a half, two years for you to pull the trigger on your first fourplex or sixplex or twoplex or whatever it is that you can start with. Um, so yeah, I'm really heavy on that. So one, one of these girls that, let's say their first year, you said they're going to make between 50 to 70, you know, what is, is your is minimum your minimum? Mm -hmm. So are you going to continue pushing on that or are you going to start teaching them? Hey, now let's see how we can also invest in your own portfolio, build that portfolio. When do you start bringing that up for them? 
I'm already bringing it up as of now. Okay. Um, I allow them, I mean, not allow them, but they, they do their own due diligence. But um, I, I, I practice a lot of uh, the investment uh, lingo with them and the calls. And I present them a lot of different scenarios of what investors look for when they're trying to pull the trigger with a commercial space. Um, and, and everything, every little cost that goes into it, because sometimes they think it's so easy as like having good credit, just putting a down payment and closing costs and that's it. And it's not like that half the time, um, especially in today's market, how everything's so fucking inflated right um so we do we go over a lot of like inspection talk appraisal talk uh tenants covering your mortgage uh, what to look for when you're dealing with section eights what's the direction that i would head to etc so i'm doing it from now it's just a matter of time until they execute that goal yeah you gotta lay the foundation right Mm -hmm. now that's it you know because if you're you're making all this money you don't know what to do with it you're sitting on it it's depreciating and but who knows because even right now this market's so weird it's a weird market, you know, because even if you do pull the trigger on a real estate property, you know, interest rates are high. Will there be a pullback? I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think there's going to be a pullback anytime soon. I in think it's going to take a long time. In certain markets, I think that there's going to be major pullback. Certain markets, Which but ones? not in Florida. I don't Which think Florida. Do you think they're going to be the pullback? I would say in more northern states, but I don't see Florida or Texas being one of them. I don't see it. No, I agree with you. I think there's going to yeah. be a lot of growth there. No, I, think we, I think we're just starting. I honestly think we're, I mean, obviously, listen, there's inflation that we know. We understand this, right? Um, and inflation has happened over and over again. And it's always about power. It's always about being in debt. It's always about not managing the money correctly and so many other things that, you know, that we can, I can talk about forever in here, right? But um, it's the demand that we have and mm-hmm. everything that we're still building. Yeah. And you could also see, like, you know, you get you got a guy like Mayor Suarez who's bringing in a lot of tech, and it's a crypto hub, and he's crypto he's, capital. He's a we very, are crypto capital, you know, and he he serves a lot of the youth, you know, so he's attracting a lot of these people over here, which is a good, and then also too, there's there's cons to it, you know, so it's one of those things where that's where I feel like Miami, I think, is just getting started, you know, like itself, just in the sense of the way that the city is growing and the plans that they have. They literally, not too long ago, they rolled out the 2030 plan of how Miami is going to look like in 2030, the yeah. way they did in 2010 for the 2020 plan. And look where it is today. Correct. It's huge. Yeah. So what makes you think they're not going to execute and get that 2030 plan done now? And the 2010 plan, they started it literally right after there was a, just a, such a big crash they're going to fuck shit up now where there's so much more power behind Miami itself. The, the name, the, the, the spirit of the people, the people, more people want to be here from other countries. The fact that we're in the, in the, we're the crypto capital, there's just so much leverage on our side that I just feel that we're at, we're right now start like, yes, we we're in a grind. We've been on a really hype, big grind where it's like exciting and people are like, this is different. So people feel like, Oh, is it going to end? Because we've never really experienced like this year, but I think it really is only the beginning for a long shot. And I, and I really believe that that 2030 plan is, is going to be that plan of, hey, we want to be a mini New York by then. And I think that's what they're going to go for. My, look, Miami might get there. It, it, it has a bunch of issues. You have public transportation. You have sea level rise. You have a lot of stuff here. Um, mm-hmm. Affordable housing is a huge problem. There's yeah. no such thing right now in this economy of a first-time home buyer. FHA is, a, in my opinion, an irrelevant program right now that serves no purpose in this current economy. Unfortunately, VAs, they're being, they're given the biggest disservice that this country can give them. You know, you went to war, you fought for this country, and then real estate agents and homeowners are not even accepting your loan. And it, and that's be, and, and it's messed up. It's messed up, and yeah. it's an unfair thing of what's going on here. And crypto, yeah, Mayor Swartz, he's passing some of these policies, but what's going to happen when the easy money is, is leaving the Wall Street? Right now, everything's being consolidated. You have the easy money that's coming out. They're removing the, the, the red tape. All that crazy stuff with the Reddit, everything that's going on. Crypto's taking a huge hit. Look at Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Now, the difference is, you know what? Right now, it's going to dip. The question is how long and how much appetite do people have to wait out that storm? That's the real question because most people don't have that appetite to wait that that whole entire term. Because if you just put 100K in the market, it went to 50. When is that investment going to come back? What kind of people are you talking about, though? Because I think very smart investors that want to hold for long term, right? Like a long time. I'm sorry. They're going to be very patient. I mean, it's not the only about who, crypto, by the way. And the this, mm-hmm. the ones who have the money, they're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna obviously sit, but eighty percent of the population doesn't have that. So now there's a, there's a huge income gap that's being created sure. right now. So yeah, absolutely. So there's a huge income gap everywhere, right? Especially we have it here in Miami, as we know, mm-hmm. right? But I think 
to be honest, selfishly, I think it's so exciting what's happening because there's a lot of new money as well, or not really new money, but just people from like New York, uh, Chicago, Seattle, California that have dumped their money in Miami, right? Um, sadly, it's, it is forcing a lot of people out of here and they're moving more north. It, you know, I have noticed that, of course. So I think we all have. But um, it's also very exciting. It's almost like Miami's being very picky on who's going to live here and who's not, right? Mm -hmm. um, a lot of these tech companies from San Francisco, they're right here in our brick or in our downtown area. I mean, that means something, you know, and as far as what you're saying, um, as far as that, you know, 80% of people not wanting to wait out that wave. I mean, who are we really talking about? Because the people that came already to South Florida, Broward, Palm Beach, off Florida, it's people that have had money to dump into these places and just sit it out. I mean, I think it's safe to say that everybody knows that this was leading up to this point of inflation. So I'm not, you know, because with, even with rentals going up, I mean, how do you see it being like a negative I, thing? I, I think, the, I think it, uh, I'm going to tell you right now, because the my incomes are not increasing as fast as inflation. The money, the money supply right now. For the, the minority of people. Not even the minority. Even if you're making 100K in Miami, that's minimum wage here. Um, can sure. We, can we agree? Can we agree to that? 100%. 100, 100 grand. You can't grand. survive with 100K. You no, cannot you survive can't. with a family, 100K. You cannot survive here. And it's 100%. an unfortunate reality. So, yeah, you're right. The tech jobs are coming here, but now you're creating a disparity within the population because you're going to start losing the culture of people that are here. A lot of people are going to start leaving. It, it's going to become, in my opinion, I think that it's great what's going on in Miami. And don't take anything that I'm saying here as bad, but right. I think that there should be a check and balance system because when you start bringing in too much money coming in and like these rents have shot up astronomical, like almost over 100%. 100%. How sustainable is that? You know? No. Like, and it's not sustainable. There's vacancies. Well, we're already seeing mm -hmm. vacancies. Vacan people can't afford it. People can't afford it. Then you have all these people from New York. I've dealt with them. Internationals. I want to Airbnb this condo. Yeah. They That's don't, the first thing. Care. They'll park. They'll Zuli, park you know I'm here. right. Come I on. Know. Don't lie to me. How many people have we spoken to? I, sp I speak to people on a daily basis. It's true. A Middle Eastern guy. Hey, I want to buy this place here in uh, the Icon. Okay, it's 700 grand. I want Airbnb. It. Can I do it? Uh, I don't know, but you want to do it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and he, yeah, yeah. And then you look in here like, yeah, okay, do it. And now well, everyone- because they're getting their 2% every single month, so. Exactly. They're going to be getting their little thing. They're going to be getting their, their, their little cut. So that's my thing that I'm challenging. I think the Miami, if we don't, if we're not careful, we can go down the route of the homelessness that's going to happen here. That's what I want. That's the, that's one of the cons. look at California. One of the cons of- bringing in tech and cryptos that's what i was saying it's a good but it's a con because you are going to start creating you know what's going on in new york and california it's a possibility i wouldn't it's say though california went to shit because of its people though what do you mean as people no, it, no. that's not what i'm saying california oh. went california did not go to shit because of its people california went to shit because of policy okay great i'm glad that you said it because that's exactly what why i went to shit for i mean it, exactly you know exactly yeah. so but miami could very well fall down into into that rabbit hole I don't know. I just don't really see it happening like that. I mean, I do see that there's a certain um, unbalance, of course. There has to be something that makes sense as far as, like, the salaries. Um, but even so, I think salaries went up, as a matter of fact. I think the minimum wage went up, if I'm not mistaken, to, like, 15, no? I saw that, I think, the other day. To 15%, but what, what difference does, does that make? That well, no, make unfortunately, right now, no, it's not, not making much of a shit. difference. You, know, you um, know where a retract will happen? I'll tell you. Here's exactly where a retract will happen. A retract will happen in the Miami market if these companies in New York and California tell their employers, hey, we ain't going to pay you the same money that you make over here by living in Miami. So if you want to make the salary you make in New York and California, you need to move back over here. That's how... That's I retracting. don't really think people are going to move back happen. like that. Yeah. If it does happen, like where they tell them, hey, your salary is going to get damaged and you're not going to be making, let's say you're making four or 500K. Um, That's actually a good point, bro. You're making four or 500K a year here in Miami, uh, you, but you're making the salary from New York and California working that job remotely here. If that company says, hey, we, you, you need to start coming back over here if you want to get paid. If not, you're going to get paid 200K a year. They're going to be like, whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, they're going to think about it. That's a that's a possible retract. Right. There's already businesses that are laying off people already. That's already happening right now. Look what's going on with Tesla. Yeah. Look what Tesla said. Tesla. Mm -hmm. Elon Musk. Even, yeah. even one of the people behind the pod recently. Apple did the same shit too. Yeah. A, a lot a lot of organizations understand what's the wave that's coming. Debt is not cheap anymore. And they're starting to lay off their workforce and accommodate, which goes back to what you were saying. This is a great opportunity to 10x your business. Because when everybody's retracting, all these businesses are pulling back. They're not putting their money anymore into ads or promoting themselves this is when the little guy comes in and can mess things up right now and step up That's and take advantage well think about it in a in a business standpoint right i mean i think that most businesses these billion dollar corporations have the pandemic did something 
right? We can oh, all agree it did, did something. It caused a lot of disruption, obviously, for the good and the bad. And I think a lot of these companies realize, like, you know what? People are working from home and everything's still fine. So why do I have an office space? Why do I have so many employees? They start delegating work overseas, which is, you know, less of a cost for them, right? And they're producing the same amount of production, the same amount of everything. So I think they, it started clicking, right? Like I, mm -hmm. th which is why we're seeing a lot of people get laid off because they realize, you know what? We either put machines or I hire people overseas, which is going to be less, right? That I have to pay out. And these people are going to work their asses off. So why pay this guy over here a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars when I could just pay the other one 30, 40K a year? I think that's part of the problem as well. Yeah. Um, Could be. I call this the nomad economy yeah. because yeah. everybody's traveling around like a, like no, a no. wild, like a, like wild. a nomadic herd. Yeah. They're like, hey, I'm going to work here in Miami. Oh, you know what? This, you know what the problem is? I'm going to tell you what the problem is. When, when we're going to start seeing people leaving, when a tropical storm or hurricane, hurricane. hits here. <laughs> we, said, already, and these, we already have one, right? Coming. We already have one coming. I, had, I spoke to one of our friends. She's a New Yorker. And she's like, I told her, hey, you know, this Sunday there's going to be a tropical storm. Be like, Get ready. She's like, what is what is this? <laughs> what you guys have you that? have light you guys have that and i'm like yeah you know what we we can even get a category five hurricane in new york they don't have that and i'm like yeah i know you have blizzards and whatever you have up there but these hurricanes here can bang you up well they have snowstorms right i mean they they're freezing their ass all year why, why would you want to be somewhere where you're freezing your ass i mean i love i love new york very much but freezing uh, yeah, you will die of the cold, and then yeah. coming to here to heat, you'll die of the heat. <laughs> but hey, we didn't have a hurricane last year. I mean, we haven't had a hurricane in a, in a while. Look, yeah. I, I tell people all the time, look, you'll be fine. We get a hurricane, you'll be fine. When it, comes to, when it comes to the hurricanes, like really, the last hurricane that hit us dead on was Andrew. <clears throat> yes. Every other hurricane just. Oh my God, that was when thirty like years the ago, nineties, right? Ninety-two. 92. That was like 30 August years ago. ninety-two. Yeah, really sad. Yeah. yeah. So really, if you think about it, like most of these hurricanes they, it's because the way that Miami's positioned that's why hurricanes usually miss Miami because of the way that it's positioned that's why it usually bounces off the sides of Florida oh really yeah oh that's amazing I had no idea yeah that's amazing I was reading the way that it flows I, obviously I don't know too detailed but I was hearing that the way that the water and the air pressure flows that usually that's why you see it picks a side it usually does it picks either it does. Look, look what happened with the Irma Irma was going to come everybody was like oh my god it's going to be another and then what did it do it picked a side it went to Naples Anthony, it, it went across through pieces of Naples and it went up the thing is is in Miami they have tremendo brujeria that they thought that's exactly <laughs> what happened <laughs> exactly they what did happened. some witchcraft down here they're like exactly hey this is not coming happened. our oh way we're gonna so walk. that's why the next one's coming directly on because they're going to be like we're going to fuck, fuck up all the well, new that's the problem because now <laughs> all, those, brujeria, all those guys gonna, uh, everyone left because it's too expensive all those guys left because they're expensive. We have no protection in Miami anymore. And now it's going to hit us dead on. I kid you not. So yesterday I was having a conversation with a potential client who's in Cali. And she said, hey, you know, I've heard that, you know, in South Florida, you guys have the people with the white dresses. And you cut like chicken heads and you do all these things. <laughs> like, she's like, do you, is that like something you guys do like prior to you moving into a property, like to bless it or whatever? I'm like, what? So, you know, really, I know we're laughing here, but people really assume that very heavy because we're like a Hispanic, we're, we're very strong in like our Hispanic nation here, specifically in South Florida. So you'd be surprised even how many people like ask me those type of questions. Even with my girls, they've asked them like stuff like that, like regarding the way that we do things here. Um, the hurricane stuff has been brought up as well. Like how do you guys uh, manage hurricanes? Did they bring hurricanes? up the chickens in the people's backyards? 100%. <laughs> 100%. I mean, we'll cut chickens if you want us to cut chickens, but no, man, we don't cut the chickens. Santeros here. in front of people's houses. Yeah. No, yeah, they yeah. only cut checks. That's what they're cutting. That's it. <laughs> you like that? I, mean, like the little cut I check love thing. that. You know what's up, Brian? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I know. I know a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah. Like, you know, I'm my toes dipped in a couple things. Listen, I, I'm just gonna say that at the end of the day, people are always gonna ha they're always gonna need a place to live at the end of the day, and and this is if you really if you really pay attention to past history, right? Um, and, and the toughest uh, economies in the world uh, for s even centuries ago. Like, history always repeats itself. And we're, what we're currently going through right now existed once. The only thing is that right now it's like the biggest shit show that we have ever seen because obviously COVID, the fucking war, this. I, like, there's just so many other outside factors. But at the end of the day, I mean, everything's going to balance out the way that it needs to and people are going to still yeah. find a place to live. And there's still deals out there, man. Yeah. I know friends of mine that are very heavy, just like you guys um, in the wholesaling and, and investing space. And there's still a lot of deals out there and there's still money to be made here in, in Florida. You just got to work for it. You got to work for it. And I'll tell you your what, ass what, what holds <laughs> Florida down still, I say, holds Florida down as attractive is number one, the weather. Number two, you got no state income, you know, got no state tax. And then number three, the governor. Homestead exception. And homestead exception. So those things will constantly bring and attract people over here. 
A hundred percent. So that, that's, that's where, where I'm like, that's where I'm like, I know Miami's going to still keep growing. Yeah. I think it's more of the, if these other things play out the retraction of what I said and some of the other stuff we were talking about, then I think there might be a, a, a slowdown. It yeah, could be a possible sure. slowdown. I think also like we've been very spoiled for a very long time. So I think we start panicking when we see interest rates going up because people don't really understand finances. People don't understand money. People don't understand the printing of money. They don't understand the outside factors. So they start freaking out with any type of little shift that might be happening, which again goes back to, you know, putting content out there with the right information, right? Um, and I know you guys are really good at doing that, by the way. You're always, you always have on here really great people and, and sharing so much knowledge and so much information. So, I mean, I personally thank you for that um but uh, at the end of the day i think we're, we've been very very spoiled and you just have to know when to shift and how to shift and uh, my two senses right now man <laughs> stack and rack put your head down and get to work really mm -hmm. that's it there's mm -hmm. no secret sauce to it you know no stacking and rack all day well zuli this was amazing yeah, man this was yeah, fun thank you so much for having me here. it was such an honor to have you here today yeah. where can people it. find you where can people connect with you uh through instagram tiktok facebook what's the username uh z calderon realtor underscore uh, for both my TikTok and my Instagram. And then my Facebook is just Zuli Calderon. Very simple. And then Easy can, breezy. can people connect with you through there to find out more info about your course, about 100%. any of the so, things that you got? Yep. So there's a link in my bio that they can click on it, a questionnaire that they can fill out. Um, and that's it. And then we'll take it from there. Last one. I know you also mentioned before to me you're preparing an event, right? Yes, sir. Where can people get information about your event? So that's also going to be through a link that Bethany Martinez and I are going to put together. It's going to be called Women with Wisdom. We were hoping to roll that out this month, but we can't do it uh, because, you know, it's just been really crazy with our teams and the expansion and we're just both been really busy, but it is going to happen this summer. Um, once that's finalized, like the location and the actual date, there is going to be a link that you can click on and just, uh, you know, register your information and we will be getting back to you uh, for you to purchase your ticket online. So amazing amazing like yeah. we always like to wrap it up on the podcast we like to go through a quick little burn around questions you ready i'm ready let's go let's first one what's the craziest and wildest experience you've ever had in the real estate game oh my god personally. um personally yeah like my, myself you yourself well one time when i was selling a property uh, my second year in real estate when i was selling a property um uh the ba so one of the bathrooms was not working for my investor and uh he, he, he had oh, a shitty. Oh, shitty. No, no. Yeah, it was <laughs> like, I, I think about this and I think of you, Anthony, with all your stories. But so I so the door wasn't working. The bathroom wasn't working. Nothing was functioning. And he was going through a really bad one. And um, I remember I had to, like, hold the door open for him. <laughs> was, I can't even talk about it because it makes me laugh. But um, I can't even talk about it. Next question. So, wait, wait, so you, call, you saw your client shitting. I'm going to start laughing like a maniac. That's fine. So you saw your client shitting. <laughs> is that you're still your client yeah i love him to death by <laughs> the way he, he knows who he is okay. there was no toilet paper or what <laughs> there was no toilet paper oh. and i only had my wipes um Lucky so you had wipes. the door was like the door was broken it wasn't even like a little bit you know it was just like a shit show i had to give him my wipes the door was kind of open i had to hold the wipe before him the toilet wouldn't flush welcome to real estate Look at that. All right. Well, yeah. I'm going to finish it off. So. <laughs> <laughs> if I keep talking What's about What's another question bad. you got? Hit us with a good question. Hey, I'm going to hit it off with, uh, with this question. What's the best advice that you would leave our audience with? Never sell yourself short. Never sell yourself short. Um, always believe in yourself and push forward and fall fast. Uh, fa fall fast, fall forward, and never sh sell yourself short. Just keep pushing forward. Amen. Boom. You guys heard it. Listen up, because the most important thing in, in, in what we said in this podcast today, I would say, is you have to keep pushing the needle forward. You have to keep buckling down, grinding it, working it. And most importantly, you have to make sure that you're building yourself up every day. The way that we had this conversation, the way Julie's build up her team, the way we build up ourselves, you have to keep building yourself up every single day. It's not going to be the funnest. It's not going to be the best experiences, but it will be worth the while once you get later to the end of that success. So if you got value out of this, please make sure to grab one thing you learned from today. Apply it right now, not tomorrow, not the next day, but right now, because right now is the moment to succeed. Make sure you like, comment, subscribe, share, leave a review, drop a rating, because the more love you show us, the more love we can show back. Till next time on the Sweat It Out Podcast.